Good morning, welcome to shul.com. We are discussing the article from Rabbi Alfred Cohen, what is Da'at Torah? We've been trying to define what it means. You know, obviously the, the definition from Lashon HaKodesh from Hebrew until English is easy, but what does it really mean? And, and how does Da'at Torah work? And what if Da'at Torah from two different individuals argue with each other? How would this all go together? Let's take a look. We are on page 23 out of 39. Uh, on our multi-part cities. Does this imply that all practicing rabbis to a voice are entitled to a voice in the formulation of Da'at Torah? Which means, if you, get, if you pass your semichat test, do you seemingly get the, uh, the, um, the sign-off of being what Da'at Torah is? I don't think so. Undoubtedly, many rabbis do not even meet the lesser, which means... <laughs> Bizarre, he got a rabbinical smicha. That's you know he passed it barely. Now you're going to give him this guy what you want to call da Torah. Secondary list of qualifications tendered by the rosh. But perhaps many in the rabbinate do indeed devote their efforts and energies to the betterment of the community, and their voices should also be heard. Although no argument is made here concerning the weight to be given to their opinions. So sometimes the opinion of a rabbi is important, but it's not classified of what da Torah would be. Let's continue. The lack of clarity or agreement about whose opinion should influence communal Torah issues is at the heart of the numerous controversies which arise concerning Da'at Torah. This is, a, this is the central issue. Who speaks for Da'at Torah and who decides who speaks for Da'at Torah? I mean, you have two issues. What is Da'at Torah? Who speaks for it? And who decides that this person is Da'at Torah? Now, of course, there's always going to be individuals that everyone will say hands down he's Da'at Torah. But I can tell you from learning with Hasidim and learning with Litvish, the Polish and Litvish teachers, and Sfaradim, the consensus is usually not equal. As an example of this vexatious problem, the hmm? the they're not equal. As, as, an, as an example of this vexatious problem, a while ago, a group of Orthodox rabbis in one community sent letters to the members of congregations of other Orthodox rabbis in the same community since the former considered themselves more learned and more pious than the later. One group, they sent a letter to another group, they, they thought that they were more hashuv, denouncing a lecture series in which some of the later rabbis had participated and urging the members of these congregations to put pressure upon their rabbis to cease participation in the lecture series. The later rabbis protested in the form of a long public letter explaining why their actions were not only halakhically justified, but had even been sanctioned by the very Rosh Yeshiva, who was nominally the rabbinic authority for those in the first group. Meaning, the group of rabbis that sent the letter to another group of rabbis in the same town, that were arguing, why did you go and do that lecture series, whatever it was, they said, the response was, what are you talking about? Your own Rosh Yeshiva doesn't agree with what you just said. Why are you coming after, after us? The major complaint in this public letter of the rabbis under attack warrants our attention, for it speaks directly to the issue we have raised. The public letter maintained that the other rabbis' real goal is to de delegitimize our view of Torah and of orthodoxy. As such, what is under attack is a religious worldview that follows faithfully in the footsteps of many great religious authorities in past periods of Jewish history, one that seeks to combine Torah in its full, in fullest embodiment with the best of modernity and contemporary culture. In short, if this is not this, or, or that local rabbi institution that is in question, but rather how we as Jews might live in this day and age committed to Torah Judaism. Now let's continue. The unwillingness to work together for the common good. We are talking about various types of orthodoxy, all people to commit to Torah and Yad Shamayim, meaning everyone who's just looking into this matter, you're already at level two which means you're already in the Orthodox world. You already you learn Torah and you have your Yirat Shamayim. You're trying to understand, okay, what is Da Torah? And you're just trying to clarify it. So everyone agrees to that. Can lead to Chilul Hashem. And it's certainly to a, a disservice to the Jewish people. Imagine when you see these two Da Torahs arguing with each other. What are people are supposed to say about this? This returns us to the obvious but thorny question. Who is entitled to an opinion on matters of importance to the Jewish community? Without doubt, this issue remains a great stumbling block in our days. Now he has here on the bottom, uh, Ashi will continue in a moment. Furthermore, who is authorized to decide which persons qualify for membership in the rabbinic conclaves whose pronouncements will be binding upon all Jews? This is a big one. A lot of times you see like these organizations which are great, Agudah Israel of America, right? 
but who who puts who puts who in who, who puts who in charge? How does it work? Is it based on a, on a wealthy person's donation that his rabbi becomes the Rosh Hashiva? Is it is it only Litvish or Polish? Is it Sfaradim? How does it work? Meaning, you, you, this organization now wants to speak on behalf of everybody, uh, but who gave you that authority? I understand you have a lot of Torah and you're very knowledgeable and you have your Achamayim, all that stuff. But why are you speaking on behalf of? Our, is that something that we agree with? Do we have? A Lishkata Gazit in Sanhedrin that we have one group. Now, of course, we need groups, but let's take a look what he says here. It would be naive to think that the membership of the Council of Torah Sages of Agudah Israel is a universally accepted group. It's not. Or that its members include all the Torah scholars whose quali- scholarship qualifies them to sit on such an august body. Meaning, many people disagree with the, with the Agudah Israel of America, and there's many Torah scholars who, knew, who seemingly would never be on it. One thing that came up recently that I know about from a meeting in Agudah was to bring Sfaradi rabbis onto the Agudah, but major ones to be on there, because for the most part, it's non-existent. And you want something that's going to speak on behalf of the yeshiva world and the Sfaradim, we need to have someone from our own there. Now, see the opinion of the Rosh in Klal 15-7 for a remarkably broad definition of of the community elite whose voices should also be heard. And he goes into detail on that. Let's continue. It is. I think in Israel, the way that they choose the chief rabbi is all the rest of the rabbis vote. So let's say you, a rabbi of Nebuchadnezzar, uh, Rushalayim, this, this. So all these rabbis, they vote who is going to be the chief rabbi. Yeah, so I asked, I asked actually, I asked this to the chief rabbi himself because I, I'm, I'm fortunate to be able to drive them here in Miami. And I've asked them, Many times how it works, they told me the system. It's first, you need qualifications, which means you need to follow certain tests for halakha. There's certain tests, yada, 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 din, yada, din. You have to go through a bunch of bunch of tests to get through. Once all the tests are passed, passed, then the person can become Rosh Ha'ir, uh, or, or Rav Ha'ir, and things of, things of that nature. Then there's qualifications for being voted in, and it's also political. It has to do with the Knesset. So it's not just a separate body. It has to tie itself to the Knesset. There is some political things that are tied into it besides the learning of Torah. And some rabbis have, have, just have no issue to even, um, to even be involved. They just want to sit and learn Torah. So sometimes those at the helm... <laughs> those were the doctor. Haim uh, Haim no, Haim Kanyas, he, he, he wasn't a rabbi of a synagogue. He wasn't anything. He just sat, learned Torah, and wrote Sfarim. That's it. That's all he did. And, and he was Da'at Torah. I would for sure say he was Da'at Torah. I think, I think everyone would say he was Da'at Torah. But he seemingly didn't sit on any council. He wasn't Rosh, uh, Rav Rosh Ha'ir or whatever. So let's take a look. It is disheartening when outstanding rabbinic figures and even Rosh Shiva are excluded from the inner circle of Torah community leaders making Da'at Torah pronouncements. Sometimes you have a major gadol and don't even include him on a, on a major announcement, especially when there is no perceived reason for their exclusion other than possibly a slight variation on some ideological, ideological non-halakhic point. Maybe he has an opinion about something that's not halakha. Suddenly, oh, we don't need it. We can't have him on board. When the prerequisites become so narrow as to exclude major orthodox groups and or their leaders, we have simultaneously narrowed the pool of those who are prepared to be guided by Da'at Torah in as much as they feel excluded for no discernible reason. Suddenly, you have a group speaking on behalf of all of Cloud Israel, but... Nobody you, chose them. No, nobody chose them, and you didn't choose anyone from their denomination because of maybe a certain disagreement of something very small, that's not even halakha, it's hashkafa, or musad, or philosophy, and suddenly, uh, people say, all right, I don't know if I'm prepared to, to, to accept, I don't have to accept this. Now, who qualifies? Let's take a look. How do we know which rabbi is a true Talmid Hakam, worthy of universal, universal deference? Okay, this is great. Who will administer the test? Why was Rav Moshe Feinstein widely accepted as the posek for American Jewry while others found their positions challenged? Nobody, when it came to Rav Moshe Feinstein, people were very fearful to even say a word against what he had to say, especially while he was alive. We are fortunate to borrow a phrase from rabbinic literature that even though Jews are no longer prophets, yet they are the children of prophets. Meaning today we don't have Nevi'im, but we are definitely the children of Nevi'im in the sense that we descend from them. And somehow in each generation there is a presence of who is truly the exceptional Tamid Hacham, fit to be the leader of the generation. Sometimes someone just becomes a Gadol, and how do we know it? Am Yisrael, who descends from Nevi'im, 
we just have that sense. There's no rule. It just happens in and of itself. And then, oh, he's a gadol. And more often than not, we're right. Maharit describes the generation's leader as all honor him because of his Torah knowledge and stand in honor before him. That's 36. It's brought down in Choshem Mishpat 2-47. Maharit attributes this opinion to the Rashba, the Rif, the Rosh, the Rambam, Maimonides, and the Tur. In our own days, we see that there is somehow an intuition of who is truly outstanding. I'll bet it is possible to fool some of the community some of the time, over time, the true Tamit Hacham is recognized and always acknowledged. So sometimes you can fool and get through, but to the end of the day, the true Tamit Hacham always, always succeeds. To some extent, it is hard to pin down the specifics of whose opinion qualifies as Da'at Torah in the modern world, inasmuch as there are many contenders for the title, some whose views are indeed steeped in Torah values, but many are not, and it is not always clear who is. So many look the part, but are not the same on the inside as on the outside. So many claim their communal positions entitle them to be given equal hearing. Sometimes someone is granted a position, pulpit rabbi of a big shul, and now they want to have a da'at Torah. But that seemingly may not even be connected to each other. And how are we to know what is in their hearts? Therein lies the core of the problem. Inasmuch as there are such high standards for an individual to qualify as possessing da'at Torah, it is not difficult to criticize communal leaders as not being wholly qualified to express Da'at Torah. The danger, of course, is that under such circumstances, this serves as a facile, facile rationalization for anyone who doesn't want to accept communal discipline. As the history of American jury attests, that way, li li that way lies disunity and disaster, which means people can start sometimes challenge the Da'at Torah with good reason, but then it weakens everything else around it because now people say, oh, why is he challenging it? He's challenging it for good reason. But now other people don't exactly see it that way. Mistakes. This is the big one. You'll see. You've been asking me about this one. And we're going to go into a little bit of philosophy on this one. Our rabbis through the ages have acknowledged that despite their best efforts, mistakes do occasionally, occasionally occur. Now look at this. <laughs> As Maharam, Maharam Sheik suddenly puts it, it is part of the human condition to make mistakes at times. Look at this note. Maharam Sheikh in Yurede'a 331. However, all author, 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 authoritative voices agree that this can never apply to the halakhic teachings of Hazal, which means when it comes to halakha, those mistakes are not acceptable. Meaning you have to go with halakha and break down what is halakha na ma'aseh. We're not going to accept those types of mistakes. What are we talking about here? Whatever is in the Gemara is true and has been accepted as such for more than a thousand years. At this point, probably two thousand years. Thus, when Hazal tell us that the biblical verse, an eye for an eye, means the value of an eye for the loss of an eye, that is correct, beyond any doubt. Whoever argues that point is simply not qualified to have any opinion in Jewish speaking. When the question of who is a Jew surfaces in Israel, anyone who does not acquiesce with Hazal's rule that a convert must accept the Torah mitzvot is simply beyond the pale of those who are fit to have an halakhic opinion, or even who is a Jew that's only someone born to a Jewish mother. Those are standards that we're not talking about. This not this is not that's not da'at Torah. That's halakha. That's clear as a crystal. There's nothing to talk about here. On the other hand, the rabbinic dicta termed agadata, okay, according to many leading thinkers, are not always to be taken literally. See, for example, Rabbi, Rav David Svi Hoffman in his introduction to the commentary on Vaikra and the two letters of Rav Samson Rafal Ahersh printed in Le Le'ela in Pesach 5749, page 30 to 35. See also comments of the Rambam by Manis in his commentary on the Mishnah, introduction to Perek Helek. Okay, let's continue. So what does the Torah mean when it instructs us to follow the teachings of the sages? and not deviate right or left. It's Devarim 17-11. The Sifri, cited by Rashi, indicates that this directs us to obey all rulings of the supreme judges of the time. Okay? Kol Asher Yerucha, what is that talking about? That's not talking about if a rabbi decide, tells you, uh, go buy that car. It's talking about a bit din and a court. Of course, this does not give the rabbis license to deliberately manipulate Torah directives to conform to their wishes, as Maharam Sheik explains. The cryptic statement of Sifre uh, does not mean that they deliberately switch left and right. Rather, they endeavor with all their strength to act for the sake of heaven. 
to arrive at the truth. Nevertheless, with all this, it is part of the human condition to make mistakes at times. Why is this important? Why is he even bringing up that mistakes are, are even something to say? He says here, it is not my intention in this study to examine the Isur of do not deviate, for it has received extensive coverage in halakhic literature. See Rambam, Hilchot Mamrim, 5, Idem, Sefer Mitzvot, uh, and then you can also see the positive mitzvah 164, Idem, you can also look Morin Nebuchim 3 41, Rambam, Sefer Mitzvot, uh, he brings in the Kuzari 43 39, Sefer Achinu 495 496, Taran, Dirashah 12. It is interesting to note that the Panim Yafor extends this rule to any Beit Din whose authority is accepted by the entire Jewish people. And see also Torah Tamiman, Devarim 17 11. But if we do interpret the Torah as telling us to follow the rabbis in all their pronouncements, then we have a big problem when or if these rabbis seem retroactively to have been mistaken. What happens if that Torah makes a huge mistake? But we, on, we don't know it at the time. We only know it in retrospect. Well, today, Baruch Hashem, we have history, we have books, and we can go back in time. And you can look back in time, Johnny, and you can kind of see, oh, wow, he made all these claims, but what we see here, history has proven that probably was the, uh, not, maybe not the best decision. Such as the quandary faced by one of the correspondents of Rabbi Eliyahu Dessler concerning the almost universal failure of European rabbis to warn Jews to escape while there was still time before the Holocaust. This is the major question. Where we're all, you, I, I agree with the Da'at Torah, but what happened before the Holocaust? How come you guys didn't uh, give a heads up? How come nobody came to the forefront and said there was the Hafez Hayim? There were, was a few. The, the, yes, the, the grandson of, the, of Nenezer and the Agudah Israel 19, late 1920s convention got up there and vocally said it, that his grandfather held it was still the mitzvah to, to inhabit the land in Israel and everyone should go. The next speaker on the Agudah Israel, Rabbi Elchanan Wasserman, told everybody to stay. That's, actually, that's what happened. Now, in retrospect, looking back, we can see that one of them gave an advice that would have saved Klal Yisrael, while the other one, unfortunately, were not Hasbe Shalom ever questioning or going into it. But in history, we got a, we're looking back in retrospect, okay, what happened here? One said, pick up and leave, and some did. Some said, stay, they all disappeared. Now, of course, there's Gezero, there's Mazal, and, we're not, and we discussed that on the other article of the Flea or the Stay with all the opinions there. But this was a question that Rab, someone sent to Rabbi Eliel Dessler. What do you do here? I agree with you, Rabbi. Rab, and it's interesting, we bumped into Rabbi Eliel Dessler. Why? Because he follows the Musar movement of our earlier teaching that we did. Rabbi Eliel Lopian, and then also the uh, Saba Mikelem, and Rabbi Sel Salant. So it's interesting. So they asked him a good question. What do we do when there's a universal failure of European rabbis to warn Jews to escape? Great question, very sensitive. On the contrary, many counseled their people that it was safer to stay in Europe, which may have compounded the tragedy for the Jewish people. Now you have two issues. One, they forgot to warn them, the Da'at Torah. And number two, those who said to stay, that seemingly backfired because it, it, it didn't help. Now, to this glaring inconsistency in the ideology of emunat hachamim, trust in, sage, in the sages, and Da'at Torah, Rab Desler responded in his Mikhtab Me'iliyahu. So he gave a response to this, and I want to read you the response. It's important to know this. Uh, it's very important. Our sages hazal, because you remember, remember you asked me, Yossi, you want to go yeah. on, We're going to go into it, Belina did, in detail. But this time we have also a that they say, Yes. To go, and we have Rabbi that say to stay. Very so good. We'll listen to so it. I don't know if there's rabbis that say to stay. Day, uh, for long term. I know there's rabbis that, like, uh, I'll get, well, let's get into it. We're going to go into it in a minute. Let's see what he has to say. Our sages Hazal have already told us to follow the words of our rabbis, even if they tell us about right that it is left and that left is right. And not to say, God forbid, that they certainly erred. We're not, we're not saying that. And no should sure anybody say that they erred. But rather, one should say that my understanding is nullified like the dust of the earth in comparison to the clarity of their intellect and the heavenly support they have, which they call Siyata Dishmaya, that this is Da'at Torah in the rubric of Emunat HaChamim, and then he writes emphasis added, which he means is that Da'at Torah is, is putting your Da'at below, above somebody else that is going to come and give you advice. Even if that advice seemingly 
is wrong. What do I mean wrong? It, it would not get you where you want to be and it would not get you the success that you're looking for or what you would think is the appropriate. That's, he's giving another explanation what Da'at Torah is. It's a new interpretation that meaning any rabbi can have Da'at Torah to in a student based on this interpretation that I, that I understand. This is a very clear statement by, made by one of the seminal thinkers of our age to whom it was evident that the outstanding rabbinic figures who led the Jewish people are inspired by a deeper understanding than the ordinary. And, that, and their whole hearts and minds being totally immersed in Torah, that renders their decisions more valid than those of ordinary people. Under those circumstances, he believes Jews ought to have faith in their leaders and follow them. And yet, one finds it extremely difficult not to assume that their advice not to flee Europe while there was still time was tragically off the mark. It is a difficult decision to, to defend, very hard to defend the decision. Perhaps it is important to realize that a bad outcome doesn't necessarily prove the advice was bad. This is very important. This okay. because, perhaps it is important to realize that a bad outcome doesn't necessarily prove their advice was bad. You, some people will see the bad outcome, like we keep on, on bringing up in, in, in this learning, but who said that the advice was bad? Even if they die. Even if they die. That's seemingly what he's saying. Yeah, but let's continue. He's, he's going to continue. Wait, it goes, it goes in. Listen, I told you, this, it gets sensitive. Sometimes the unexpected... What is the window of time that they had from to leave? Like... So Hitler rose, Hitler rose to power, I believe, in 1933, if I'm not mistaken. But we're going to go into it. Just give me a minute. Let me, let's finish this point because we're going to we're opening up something that's sensitive. I told you. You asked me about it. You know, see, and we're going to go into it because today there's a different issue. We have a country of Israel. We have Tamidei Chachamim in Israel that far supersede what we ever had ever had in the history of the Jewish people in the last thousand years, maybe. Where they're in Israel, they have Bate Dinim in Israel, they're learning. We're in a different status, and we're also, we are, I believe, the minority today. Back then, majority of Jews were, in, were not in Israel. Today, that had flipped, I believe, a few years ago. We already had reached 51% of Jews in Israel or more, as opposed to out. So now the question is, what are you doing outside of Israel? It's the, it, it switches now. It doesn't, it does not. It used to be there was no issue, or, 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 or I should say no issue. It was a small issue, but not of a significant nature. There wasn't a lot of rabbis in yeshiva. Today, what is, what is exactly the excuse? Usually the excuse is one thing, or two things. Money and uh, chinuch yeladim. Those are the only two that this I see. Is, this is every rabbi that I And it's important. Too, that's, you know, that's uh, the question. And I'll tell you what Rav, Rav David Abu Hatzera told me. When I wanted to move to Israel a few years ago, I told them, listen, I, I figured out a couple of things, I can do it. I told them it'll be fine, it'll work just fine. He didn't tell me no. He said, don't come so fast. He said, out in my head. He said, wait. And then I had called him back and told him I want to move to Miami when I was in Brooklyn. And he said, Run. he goes, <laughs> and, and, and so I ended up coming here instead. But I, I, when I had spoken to him at the time, uh, he didn't say don't come. He said, just wait. He says, it could, because and interesting, I know that he's told. I know, I, I know, I, I know that he's told people before to come, yeah. and he's told people not to come. He's been very vocal about this, so it's interesting. Some people he said come, and some people he says no, stay. Now, if you, and I know that many people asked Rav Chaim Kanievsky. Rav Chaim Kanievsky was very clear: come with Israel. There was there wasn't any. You know what he told me? Huh? He told me Meshigna. Yeah, Meshigna. <laughs> so I don't know why Meshigna. Yeah. Also with his son-in-law, or whatever with the guy that. Yeah. Next to him. You didn't need an interpretation for that. That you understand. That, that no, you I understand. Yeah. Should I come to Israel? I was on the way from Israel to the airport. I stopped by Rav Haim Kanievsky. From there, I, go, I fly to the airport and came here. I go to, uh, I think it was my grandma. Yeah. Shiva. Uh -huh. So I told him, should I come to Israel? Yeah. What is the question? What is that question? <laughs> what is so, uh, the, because he said Meshuga, I asked him, I said, he told me, this is not a question. If you need to be here on Israel, of course you need to be in Israel. It's not what you have to be in Israel. Listen. It wasn't like a question, oh, you can do this or money, I know, this, that. That was, <laughs> this is. I mean, it's here. You, no, I mean, in Israel, figure it out. Find a town, place, find the yeshiva. I Meaning, you got to figure out what it, where the puzzle piece, where the Tetris piece will fall, but that's your responsibility. But most rabbis, like yeah. you said before, the two questions that you bring, that's what they... Yes, and by I the way... To, I went to many rabbis. It's very important. 
Money and uh, Hinuch Hiladim. Hinuch Hiladim. Now, yeah, but, you know, there could be other things involved in somebody say, oh, why well, you should come. I'll give you an example. Let me hear. I'm dying to go to Israel, but I have to leave my mother-in-law here. I mean, some people will say that's a mitzvah. I'm just, <laughs> I'm just joking. <laughs> no, I'm just joking. Uh, yeah. We're recording, being recorded. No, I'm just joking. Okay. No, yes. You are, so bring her. Oh, you can't bring yeah, her. Yeah. It's, awesome. it's not, not easy. So it's, you're stuck. Listen, that, that's why it says Eretz Yisrael Niknet Biyusinin. Why do? Why are there all these difficulties? Because the first time that we were given the land, we didn't accept it. If we would have accepted Nasev Nishma both, it would have been a tremendous beracha. But we, we 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 offended the land, and the land, and Hashem said, "You offended the land. It's not my business. You got to deal with the land." Now, when you want to come in, you they, the land wants to know. You really want me? You're, if there's going to be a missile that goes, and it's going to have to go, that person has to go into a shelter. You really want me? Are you going to leave? The land wants to know. Do you really want me? And don't, don't underestimate the feelings of land. All of our food come from the land. That's where you're going back. And Hashem said, this land is a special land. It connects itself. With the, it was, it's the center of the world. There's, there's so much there. Let's, let's continue on one more part. Sometimes the unexpected does happen, which no one could have predicted. Sometimes surgery must take place. But the patient dies of an allergic reaction to, an, to anesthesia. I mean, he didn't die from the surgery. He died from the thing. I had a friend in Brooklyn whose father was very healthy. He went for a regular checkup in the hospital. He ended up catching a, uh, what they call it, the super bacteria. He ended up dying from nothing to do when he went into the hospital. So the Gizarot of Hashem. Let's continue what he has to say here. That doesn't mean it was a mistake to perform the necessary surgery. It just means that we are not always in control of the consequences of our seemingly wise decisions or even that we can always foresee all the possible results. Let's look at what he has a huge thing on the bottom here. The Gemara derives a very important article of belief when it addresses the issue of Torah leaders making mistakes. In Masechet Gitin, page 56b, the Gemara records the famous encounter between Rabbi Yohanan ben Zakkai and the Roman general Ves- Vespasian during the siege of Jerusalem in 69 CE. So Vespasian... He, he ends up uh, circling the city and he notices the wall is going down, it's sinking. And even he's intrigued. Just as a side note, the biggest enemies of Yahadut and of the Jewish people, they know one thing. When we sit, learn Torah and do mitzvot and have achdut, they have nothing, they cannot even penetrate in any capacity. It doesn't work at all. And so, Vespasian knew they were fighting between themselves. They knew they were not doing the Torah and the properly. And he saw it himself. He said, God's going to give me this town, because you, this city, because you guys are not behaving properly. At that time, when Vespasian heard that he had just been chosen as the new Roman emperor, he offered to grant Rabbi Yohanan whatever he, had, he asked for. The rabbi... Rabbi Yohanan told him that he was... An yes, that was the whole story. Here, he's, he's cutting it in short. You're right. He, he told him that. And he said, how could you call me your... You're rebelling. He said, no, no, no. Then they came a minute later and they told him, oh, I'm, because you did that, I'm going to grant you three wishes, like a genie in a bottle. The rabbi requested that the Romans spare the town of Yavne. That was a huge decision. Why? Yavne was Yavne v'chachameh, all the yeshivot. So he said, even if you can destroy the Beit HaMikdash, let us go continue learning and teaching Torah. That was how Torah was saved. If it was not for Yavne, the has uh, and Torah could have been forgotten. And it's and it's yeshiva. B grant clemency for Rabbi, for the Nasi Rabbi Gamliel and his family. Why? Because he was from Machut Bet David. He said, we need to have families of Machut Bet David that we can keep protected so that we can have a king of David HaMelech that's going to return with the Mashiach. So he said, please keep this family and don't harm them. C. Send for a doctor to heal Rabbi Sadok. Rabbi Sadok was very sick. He was a saintly individual who had fasted for years. I think they fasted, he fasted something for 40 years. He would eat like one date, and when he would eat the date, you would, the people were able to see the date go into his mouth, through his throat, into his body. That's how skinny he was. The, the obvious question is asked, why didn't Rabbi Yohanan simply ask for the Beit HaMikdash to be spared? Meaning you literally are dealing with the general who wants to destroy it. Why don't you just tell him, while you're at it, don't do this. Now, one of the answers tended by the Gemara is most enlightening. The verse in Yeshaya 44 states, he turns wise men backwards and make their, makes their thinking foolish. So according to this pasuk that the Gemara brings, it seems like that was, I shouldn't say a mistake, but it seems it wasn't the way the Hachamim would have expected well, I, I read that uh, he knew that 
that particular wish. Yeah, we're going to get to it. In other words, it was the divine plan that the, the temple be destroyed, and therefore Hashem deliberately prevented Rabbi Yohanan from making the wise request which, have sa- which would have saved it from destruction. We, we ordinary mortals who are not blessed with the wisdom and insights of Hazal cannot make such pronouncements regarding any specific episode or rabbinic advice. Nevertheless, we should take to heart the essential message that there are times when the divine will obscures an individual's wisdom. Sometimes God does not want a person to think some one way, and he removes it completely. He gives them everything, and that seemingly is part of the Gezerah. Mulling over this paradox, Rav Hutner offered the following metaphor. This is very important. Assume there are two people poised to jump off the roof of a building. Okay? Two people. All right, they're on the same building, they're about to jump off. Horrified onlookers beg them not to, no, don't jump, don't jump. Today, people say, jump. No, but back in the day, you know, today, today people are looking for the action. What do people do today, right away? Boom, they got the camera, jump. And they start, they start okay, but we're talking about a time where people cared about people's lives. Okay, Hor- <laughs> horrified onlookers beg them not to. One agrees and proceeds to take the stairs in order to reach the street. So one guy says, okay, I'm not going to do it. He goes down the steps. He goes, but he trips and breaks his neck and dies on the steps. The other man, he decides to jump, but happens to land on a mattress on the back of a truck and he survives. Uh, what would happen here? It's the weirdest outcome. Although the outcome for him was miraculous good, and even, even more so in the face of what happened to the other would-be jumper, <laughs> yet it would be ridiculous to blame the onlookers for giving bad advice. You're going to blame now the onlookers? No, don't jump. Yeah, yeah, but but why would you blame them? The guy tripped and died, and nothing to do with him. And here we're blaming the onlookers, which you're saying are the rabbis, why are you blaming them? The, 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 God had a gizera, and it's mazal. Although the outcome for him was miraculous good, and even more so, okay, in the, in the face of what happens to the other, the other would-be jumper, yet it would be ridiculous to, to blame the onlookers for giving bad advice. The advice was wise, and the one who listened to them indeed chose the right path. The guidance of our Torah leaders, Reb Hutner concluded, is just that. Torah inspired wisdom, but it is not prophecy, and it is not failsafe. Our rabbis are wise men; they are not prophets. It's very important. It's very important. Now he has a point. Let me just read it. Now this was heard by the author from the Rosh Hashiva, Rav Hutner. Meaning, this is Rav Alfred Cohen who heard it directly from it. You had something to say? Yeah. But so the, the, that for me, that, that brings up two main questions. One is. Wouldn't that Torah only be able to be questioned by that Torah? Because oh, no, we're going to get to it. Uh, that's exactly, we're going to get to a beautiful piece from Rav Moshe Feinstein. You're going to see what he had to say now. It's like me opining on some orthopedic surgeon's PhD paper. And I say, okay, well, I don't agree with that. Like, okay, well, what do you know about this? Okay, so very good. Now, now that, well, usually when they attack the character of the individual, that means that they're not ta- attacking the discussion at hand. I see that all the time. Whenever someone goes after the character of a person in a discussion, whether or not he's wrong, he might be right, by the way. But, but, but now you weakened your argument. That means that you clearly have nothing to argue on the point. Now, you, if I use your statement, then seemingly everything Moshe Rabbeinu said could not have been challenged. But if you look throughout the Torah, many groups challenged him. Korach challenged incorrectly and failed, but many challenged properly in the right way, and they were heeded. And so it's important to know, yes, but you can challenge the Torah, and we're going to see that right now. And in fact, when you brought up the science and the medical thing, I can tell you most of the medical innovations came from people who challenged the status quo. They did not accept what was being said and what was being done, and they challenged it, and seemingly they came up with new innovations in the medical fields, which changed the world. Let's continue. Moreover, when two Talmudic sages disagree, it does not mean one of them is wrong. The minority opinion is a halakhic discussion is not wrong. There, there may be several acceptable opinions, but in actual practice, only one can become the universally followed mode. And, and that is the prerogative of the majority. The issue is discussed at length by the Ran in his commentary on the Talmud in Derashot Haran 3, 5, and 11. There is a very famous but troubling episode recorded in the Gemara about a session of the Sanhedrin, where the sages were called upon to decide whether a certain object was Tameh or Tahor. It's brought down in Masech and Baba Metziah 59a. The majority voted that it was Tameh in op- opposition to the opinion of Rabbi Eliezer, that's Rabbi Eliezer HaGadol, who was so sure that it was Tahor that he called upon heaven itself to confirm his opinion as correct. Let the walls of the, Torah, of the study hall prove that he is right. The, sec- the Gemara records 
that in response to his demand, the walls of the study hall indeed began falling down or caving in, as I remember. Nevertheless, the rabbis in majority refused to concede. Finally, a voice from heaven, a bat call, even declared that Rabbi Eliezer was right, and yet others stuck to their guns. Ultimately, the ruling remained as the majority had declared it, and even more so, not only had it stayed the same, they ended up uh, giving, putting Rabbi Eliezer in Hedim for not accepting it, and it was, uh, there was a very you know, um, unpleasant outcome when the rabbis went to meet him at the end and what he had told them. This begs the question, if heaven itself protests against their ruling, how in the world could they, or would they, stubbornly stick to it? If they have a bat call coming from the Shemaim saying that, they, that, that, that the other rabbis are right, how are they challenging, challenging it? What kind of, what kind of um, uh, authority, yeah. authority would you need if the heaven themselves are coming down and giving a haskama to the Da'at Torah of Rabbi Le'ezid? Now this was, of course, we shouldn't say Da'at Torah because this was a halakha discussion. And Da'at Torah usually is not in the discussion of halakha matters because halakha has, a much more, has much more clarity to it. In his exposition, the Ran offers a, fantastic, a fascinating and fantastic answer. Behold, they, the majority, clearly saw that Rabbi Le'ezid's position accords with the truth more than theirs. Even the rabbis, according to the Ran, agreed that he was right. And that was Tanuro uh, Shahachinai. That was the whole oven. That, what was it? It was an oven that they said, if you take it apart and put it back together, whether it's Tameh. Nevertheless, they proceeded to act in accordance with their majority opinion, inasmuch as their understanding led them to consider it Tameh. And even though they realized that their understanding is opposite of the truth, they did not want to declare the object a whore, but rather they stuck to their decision to declare it Tameh, because if they had changed their decision, it would have been going against Torah teaching which gives the final decision to the scholars of each generation to rule in accordance with their understanding and that, and that which they rule. That is what God commanded. And so and he brings this down in Dirashot Haran number 7. The Geran goes even further in his Dirashah 11. The matter is as follows. As we have already written, that Hashem Yitbarach ceded the ruling on these halachic matters to the minds and hearts of the scholars of every generation. And he commanded us to follow them. Thus, it results that whatever they agree to on one of these issues, that is what Moshe Rabbeinu was commanded from the mouth of God. We'll end it with this. This is also the opinion of the Maharal expressed in his Gur Ariye commentary to, to Rashi on the verse in Devarim 17-11, which instructs us to follow and not deviate neither to the right or left from the teachings of our rabbis. For he who commanded in the Torah about prohibited or permitted matters also commanded this, do not deviate from whatever they teach you. They is plural. Con consequently, if a person follows whatever they, the rabbis of his generation, told him to do, he is acting totally with, the, with permission, since that is what the Holy One commanded, to follow their words in whatever they teach us, and he also put in the Torah not to deviate from their teachings, so that even if they made a mistake, you are acting correctly and are fulfilling a mitzvah of God. So even if the mistake comes out of it, you still follow what Hashem had wanted, even in the case of the Holocaust. See also the Arba Barbanel's Bar commentary to Parashat Shoftim Note 8. The only difference that I would say back then and now is that there's probably more rabbis in Israel that would you can probably bring that you would call Da'at Torah in regards to the issue of whether or not to go to Israel or to stay. And so we'll end it with this today, and then we will, uh, Bezat Hashem, continue next time. Baruch Adonai Le'olam. Amen ve'amen.